Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. I've conducted hundreds of them now, and um, if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, go to bathgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Um, this program is made possible by the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. And uh, so, uh, thanks to those who've been supporting it, and if, if you appreciate it and would like to support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of, the, of BatGap.com. My guest today is Natalie Sudman. Um, Natalie is an author, an artist, uh, and a psychic intuitive. Um, she worked as an archaeologist in the Great Basin states, which is what, Nevada, Utah, that area, right? Wyoming, Wyoming, yeah, Wyoming, yeah. a little bit of South Dakota, nice Eastern area. Oregon. Mm -hmm. So you did that for 16 years before accepting a position managing construction contracts in Iraq. In 2007, Natalie was seriously injured in a roadside bomb. And during this incident, she had a near-death experience that she details in her book, which is called Application of Impossible Things. Here's the book. There's a picture of her in the back with George Bush some irony in that <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there is. yeah uh, <laughs> this is a fascinating book um, it's it's quite thin and when I first got it I thought oh this is an easy read I'll finish this in a couple of nights and but it took me all, all week to read mostly in the evenings um, because it's so rich and there's so much kind of depth of wisdom and insight in each page that I found myself rereading many paragraphs and sentences several times and then just pondering them. So I, I really enjoyed the book and I, I felt like I learned a lot from it and I, ho I hope I'll learn even more from this interview and that all of you watching and listening will as well. So thanks for doing this Natalie, I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me Rick. Yeah, it's really been good getting to know you so far through your book and our, our brief conversations, <laughs> mostly about technical things. Incidentally, if, if people listening hear a little kind of staticky sound during the interview, it's something we couldn't figure out how to eliminate it. I think it has to do with the fact that Natalie is in the boondocks of southern Arizona on a satellite internet connection. Um, so there's just a little bit of noise in there that we can't eliminate. But this is really quite legible. So um, just out of curiosity, uh, what kind of archaeology were you doing? I was doing survey archaeology, so I wasn't digging. Most mm -hmm. people ask what I dig up, but mm -hmm. I've never really done much digging. Um, when when uh, public or, let's say, um, government-funded, federally government-funded projects are built on, on public land, mm. an archaeologist has to go out and look around okay. on, on the surface of the land first and make sure there's nothing there. So are you looking for like dinosaur remains or Native American remains or anything that happened to come uh, up? Yeah, anything that happened to come up. It mm -hmm. might be historic, you know, mining or um, homesteading or things like that. Mm -hmm. But also it could be prehistoric, a lot, mostly prehistoric sites. Yeah. And then we were, although archaeologists are not paleontologists, and the geologists should have been out looking for the <laughs> dinosaurs and paleontology, we were tasked also with with looking for those kinds of things okay yeah now you mentioned in your book and in some interviews that i listened to um that you had had some kind of psychic abilities throughout your life was do you mean by that like even as a child or or what and what kind of psychic abilities yeah i remember as a kid um talking to spirits mm -hmm. and i would have dreams that would later happen um, and and I I think I was aware of of the thin difference between non physical and physical because I remember sitting like sitting in church and staring at someone and going scratch your ear scratch your ear scratch your ear <laughs> <laughs> and then they would and then they would yeah. you know and so I, I kind of understood the power of thought without thinking of it in that way yeah. you know you should have done um, something really fun like. Quack like a duck, quack like yeah, a duck. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be really fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, those kinds of things. And then I, I always had an interest in um, 
the kind of the psychic or the super normal. Mm -hmm. And so um, I read a lot of books. I, you know, I, I, uh, I kind of followed that interest or that curiosity. And I did do some readings for people um, starting maybe in the late 1990s. Okay. Uh, and you do on. some even now, don't you? But it's taken on yeah. a different um, quality since your whole NDE. Right, yeah. I do them professionally now. And, right. Um, whereas before I just kind of read for friends once in a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to get into your story in a second, and uh, I just wanted to say something. I was thinking about it and thinking about fit, fitting you into the, the context of this show, which is about, you know, spiritually awakening people, spirituality quite broadly defined. And, um, and the way I define it is just, it's not just a matter of sort of realizing the non-dual essential nature of things and then declaring the world as an illusion and that, that there's no, no, yourself doesn't exist and that's the end of it. It's, it's really becoming a knower of reality in its totality, which includes both absolute and relative and which includes all the, the subtle mechanics of relative creation and what's really going on. Uh, I think that that's a more mature way of looking at it, really becoming a knower of reality in all of its dimensions and facets. And I think that um, your book and your whole experience contribute significantly to that understanding, at least they have for me. Um, you want to comment on that before we get into your story? Yeah, I think that's a really good way to think about it. I think um, it's the way spirituality is often talked about is as if it were a, a subset of or separate from the physical reality, mm -hmm. it, that it's something different from vacuuming and um, changing the oil in the car. <laughs> but it's not. Right. It's, it, you know, people say to me, um, well, I want to, I want to, I'm tired of doing this job. I want to do something more spiritual. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, <laughs> what could be more spiritual than whatever you're doing? Um, instead of thinking um, that spirituality is something that we gain from outside of ourselves or that we um, acquire in some way, if we instead realize that we are the spiritual and we bring that to whatever we perceive or do or um, experience, then I think we're closer to the truth. And I think that's just another way of saying what you just said. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, the, just on a note on that is that the, the Bhagavad Gita goes on at quite some length about the importance of doing your dharma, you know, being in accordance with that course of action which is evolutionary for you, which may not mm -hmm. be the same as somebody else's dharma, but it's, it's yours, and, and therefore, right. you know, you do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, that's your most evolutionary course of, of action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, so you were over in Iraq in 2007 as a um, construction contractor of some sort, overseeing construction projects, right? And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I um, I was not a contractor. I was uh, I was an employee of the army. Okay. A civilian employee of the army, and I was yes um, administering construction contracts. Yeah. Right. And you were um, coming back to base in an armored Land Rover, not armored enough, apparently. Uh, <laughs> when, uh, when it, uh, yeah, incidentally, I mean, I heard this whole thing about how they, they could have built the Land Rovers and so on with this sort of V-shaped armored thing at the bottom that would have deflected any bomb that go, went off, but there were budgetary restraints or something and they never got around to doing it. And, you know, the consequences were rather severe for a lot of people, but. That's yeah, a, that didn't really apply to to your particular Those system. were, yeah. I mean, um, they did build some mm -hmm. vehicles with the V. Um, it's expensive to build them. And uh, we were not traveling in army vehicles. Uh -huh. we, tra we traveled in, um, well, we had personal security details mm -hmm. who are the personal security um, people are most familiar with Blackwater, which is oh, yeah. not... A, not 
not a company that I would endorse in any way, mm -hmm. but the companies that I worked with, one especially, a British company, they were, um, they were very, very good. They were very professional and very understated, mm. not, not the kind of sort of um, macho aggression of Blackwater, but mm. it was a personal security detail, so okay. our vehicle. Yeah, so you were so you were in this little convoy of about four vehicles coming back from the day's work and getting quite close to base when this bomb went off and take it from there. Yeah, um, so I was kind of sitting in the vehicle with my head on my hand, kind of eyes closed, half asleep at the end of a long day. And all I remember is I was there and then I was not. I was outside the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And, um, or I wasn't outside the vehicle, I was somewhere else. I was standing, away. I found myself standing on a kind of stage. Um, and there were thousands of beings arrayed all around me. So if you picture kind of a stadium-like setting, that's what that was like. And I was um, downloading information to them. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't confused about where I was. I knew exactly what where I was. I knew exactly what I was doing. And um, so I, I downloaded this information and then I communicated to these beings and it wasn't, you know, I used, I used the word telepathy or mind-to-mind um, -mind communication, but it wasn't really even that. It's sort of, um, it's sort of instantaneous knowingness of whatever is given. <laughs> so. So I let, anyway, I let them know that I wasn't going to come back, that I had no interest, I was done here, and, um, and they, that was accepted. But then they also kind of went, well, yeah, um, how would you like to, um, what if you did this? What if you went back into this? Hmm. And then I was immediately like, oh, yeah, that sounds like fun. <laughs> Easy to convince. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> kind of a pushover. Didn't, didn't take much. <laughs> yeah, uh, it doesn't take much when you offer something. <laughs> well, let, me, let me interject a couple of questions here. I'm not going to ask too many skeptical questions because I really believe your story. But for the sake of those who might have them in mind, um, you probably heard this before. Some people might say, "Well, yeah, you know, you've just been brain damaged by an explosion, and the brain can conjure up all kinds of things uh, as a result of some traumatic injury." How do you know this whole thing wasn't some hallucination triggered by the injury? You know, I don't argue with people. Right. <laughs> if you haven't had an experience like this and you don't want to believe, then I can understand why you wouldn't believe it. Uh -huh. But if you've had an experience like this, it's more real than this physical world is. Good answer. It's more real. Yeah. 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 All right. Second question. Um, ordinarily, it would take weeks to fill a stadium. Let's say Paul McCartney is going to give a concert. You have to sort of publicize it and then, you know, sell tickets. And then on, on the day of the event, it would take a few hours just to get everybody into the hall. And, you know, here you have a near death. You, you're sort of on the other side. And instantaneously, there are thousands of beings assembled around to, to receive your, your download. Um, how is that organized? That's a good question. I never really thought about that. So <laughs> the first thing that that I see is or feel is that they were already there. Waiting I mean, it, it's like, yeah, it's like it, uh, maybe I was already there, too. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no time. So it doesn't make sense to say, well, it takes time for them to get there. Right. But does kind of doesn't make sense because I'm in it. I'm in an environment that where, where time doesn't exist in any way that we understand it. Not literally so, at all. Mm -hmm, right. right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, instantaneous, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like instantaneous would be a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so what kind of information were you downloading or uploading as the case may be? I'm not sure which the word would be. Yeah, um, I describe it in my book as broadly cultural, and and when I say that, I mean um, cultural, all from the sense all the way from from the sense of how um, individuals 
um, act and react and influence or are influenced by culture mm -hmm. all the way up to um, broad flows of energy or organizations of energy that support and maintain cultures. Mm -hmm. And this is stuff that you had gleaned from your experience as a human being, presumably. Yes. Yeah. Do you have the sense that, um, you know, you had a, a greater s sense of brotherhood or sisterhood with those beings than you have had with human beings and that you were some sort of emissary who had been sent here to, you know, gather information and come back and convey it to them? Anything of that nature? Well, I definitely felt more at home with them than I do with people or incarnated <laughs> human <laughs> beings, <laughs> however you want to yeah. say that. Um, I definitely felt much more comfortable with them. I think, um, I don't know, emissary. Um, I think that I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't use that word because my understanding of the word emissary would be that they sent me. Right. But it's more a sense of um, an e a more egalitarian decision, maybe, or something. Mm -hmm. It's more like um, this needs to be done, or we would like this done. Um, you're really good at this. Do you want to go? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe some other being said, yeah, you know, I don't really want to do that right now. That's not what I'm doing. And I said, well, I'll do it or whatever. You know, I don't yeah. know exactly how it happened, but it feels everything feel, felt very egalitarian there. It was right. not anybody ordering anybody around or mm -hmm. or telling anybody what they had to do. You know, it, it was really every individual makes their own decisions and um, and and makes those in the context of um, the whole or the all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you feel that, um, I'm just asking questions as they occur to me, do you feel that um, that is true of all of us on earth pretty much, that we have all just signed up for this voluntarily and in whatever circumstances we find ourselves born, it was pretty much our choice to sign up for that? That's my understanding. That that would be my, that's the easy assumption for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because if it's true for me, what, why am I special, you know? Yeah. It's probably true for everybody else too. And yet I don't, I don't rule out the, um, the possibility that somebody else got sent here. I mean, why not? The infinite is infinite. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, Everyone doesn't have to do things the same way. And also, you know, I've heard other people say, well, I left my body and I was sent back. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, maybe you were sent back, but maybe that was another aspect of you. Maybe, you know, it's possible that I could have um, encountered a being who said, you know what, you're going to have to go back. Mm -hmm. and, and I could understand that being as a separate being, someone in charge of me. Or I could understand that being as an aspect of me that I was not sort of comprehending or reintegrating with at that point because I was holding on to enough of this human mind habit. Um, you know, I, I couldn't really re-perceive myself or something. So I don't, I don't know that it's always so simple as... Um, we all know our own volunteer actions, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I kind of get the feeling as we're talking that, you know, what we tend to do is we want to fit it into the, into some kind of conceptual box that we're comfortable with. And so, you know, we, we try to take something that's far beyond our direct experience and, and kind of fit it into our human understanding. And mm -hmm. it ends up really being a poor fit, you know, <laughs> kind of like yeah, trying to or, put a square peg in a round hole or something. We, we really can't do justice to it. Yeah, I think that's true on a certain level, and yet we can only know what we know. Right. And so I don't necessarily think that there's anything wrong with trying to do that. It's I natural, think that, 
Yeah, it is natural to try to make sense of our world. Mm -hmm. I think um, that my sort of um, wariness of that comes in in when people say, "Well, I fit the sense of this is this is how it is." The oh, end. Yeah. No, I you wouldn't know, do that. If you yeah. Can, yeah, if you can leave the door open and say, well, this is how I understand it right now, I wonder what else is out there for me to understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a more of an actual scientific attitude. For me, everything is theoretical, and some theories mm -hmm. hold a lot more water than others, um, right. but you can't be adamantly certain about any of them, nor, nor can you adamantly mm -hmm. and totally reject any of them. You know, it's all mm -hmm. possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, I like to say at the end of some, you know, sometimes I get going and that's like, I'm, it's like this, da, 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 da. I like to remind myself at the end, I could be wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. What was I going to ask next? Oh, well. Um, it'll come to me. Well, we were talking about... There's a lot in your book about dimensions. Um, here's a few little snippets that I typed out. Each dimension offers access to others, but no one offers access to all. Each dimension has its own rules or laws or guidelines. Um, all dimensions are aspect of, aspects of one encompassing reality. Um, so those are several little quotes. And... Um, I could extract a question from that, but I, I get this, I've always thought, not always, but in my more ad, wiser years, <laughs> that, <laughs> that um, you know, that life is very multidimensional and mm -hmm. that, um, you know, different beings have, diff have access to different, it's like a spectrum, you know, and different mm -hmm. beings have access to different portions of the spectrum. And mm -hmm. in some cases, those portions overlap. You know, mm -hmm. like, like a Venn diagram where there's some outside the overlap area and some within it. And in other cases, they're, they're completely separate. There's no correlation or connection or whatsoever. They're, different beings are, are experiencing just completely different aspects of reality. Um, so I think I can go ahead and comment on that. And I may have a follow-up question or two. Okay. Yeah, I think that's kind of, um, that's a good uh, a good restatement of what I was saying, I think. I think a lot of people think, well, here is here and there is there. Right. You know, there is heaven and it's like this mm -hmm. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> um, and I think that if you think about the, the infinity of experience that's available here in this physical world, you know, there's somebody living in the Amazonian jungle um, wearing leaves, you know, and then there's somebody in Paris who is going to a fashion show, a high fashion show. <laughs> like, wait, is this the same world? Yeah. You know, there, and then there's everything in between that. Mm -hmm. And um, why do we think that there ha is just one thing? It's not just one thing. You can continue to have varied experiences. And from what I, from what I understand or what, from my experiences, there are many places there too you know um whether they're they have form or another form of form or no form um they still have the uh, they are environments in which we can experience and expand and explore and to think that there's only one one uh possibility once we lose the physical body it is uh, seems pretty limiting yeah. when infinity is infinite. <laughs> yeah, I think Jesus said something like, "In my Father's house there are many mansions," and mm -hmm. and the Buddhist and Hindu traditions have all discussions of all these lokas and levels mm -hmm. and realms and whatnot that the different beings live on. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I think we see oh, it too. I'm oh, sorry. No, you can. I think uh, another way that I describe it is to say, you know, a cat has, we were talking about cats earlier, mm -hmm. cat has its own reality. We only overlap it in certain places. Yeah. It has its own life and its own reality, its whole different way of perceiving this world. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and um, it doesn't mean that it's not in the same reality as we are. But it, it, 
understands it in a, in a whole different way. So it's like tuning the the radio to a different station, and then sometimes there's this overlap of the two stations. Yeah, good. So let's get back to your experience. So you're standing there on this dais, downloading or communing with a multitude of beings in some sort of stadium-like setup. Um, so what happened next? So after I had agreed to um, come back into the physical body, then I, what I call blinked to another environment. I say blinked because it was, it's that simple and effortless, but it's also that instantaneous. So I was, again, I was in front of all these beings on this dais and then I was not. I was in this, um, in what, I, it's what I call the, the deep rest environment. I was, I let's say that I had a form of a form, but I was more, I felt more like an organization of energy. And it was, it was black. I described that blackness as potential light. And um, it was not a, like a scary darkness. It was a very sort of velvety, deeply comfortable, comforting, relaxing um, darkness. And um, so, in this place, when I first got there, there were a couple other beings there and they were sort of tinkering with the organization of my energy. So it was almost like the car getting tuned up. <clears throat> they're not changing anything, you know, they're not changing out the engine or something. They're just kind of um, making sure everything is running smoothly. And then when they were finished with that, then I had um, a, a, a version, I guess, of what people describe as a life review. But whereas other people have described um, that as being um, kind of traumatic or very emotional, um, for me it was more like um, a really enjoyable look through the old scrapbooks or something <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know it was um there wasn't any judgment attached to anything i i could um i could enter into enter into a memory and and feel not only my own um emotions and and thoughts about that experience but also enter into any aspect of that experience so not only enter into say someone else's perception of that experience but i could enter into i don't know how to describe this the the mood of the experience or i could enter into some kind of holographic uh organization of energy that was created by that experience Holographic isn't a good word. Organization of energy is better. Okay, it's all right. Um, <laughs> did you ever read Michael Newton's books? No, I, I haven't. I've read little pieces and parts of one of them, but okay. I was just I, I read a couple of them. I was just curious. He was this hypnotist that almost accidentally at first um, regressed people back to the period between lives, and then he that he made that his specialty and ended up. Um, hypnotizing and interviewing thousands of people in that way and came up with a very consistent pattern of, of what people apparently experience, you know, between lives. And I, I was just asking you if you had read it, because I was curious to see whether um, your experience jibes with what he said. But so far, as I re recall his books, it, it pretty much does. But I, like you say, said earlier, there are probably different flavors available for different people. It's not all one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Um, Irene just asked a question, um, was this all happening as you were immediately injured or while in the hospital in recovery or does she know? And that's similar to what I was going to ask, which is you, you, you remember all this in great detail. When did you remember it? Did you remember it like instantly as you came, as you regained consciousness or months later in the hospital or, or what? I, when I first to answer her question, um, it happened while 
when I was injured, while I was, I was still in the truck, I, we were still rolling down the road. Yeah, so yeah. you kind of came back to this world and immediately you, you retained the, the recollection of what you had I, just experienced on the other side. I didn't side. remember everything. Right. I remembered, I knew I had been somewhere else, mm -hmm. but I immediately set it aside yeah. to deal with what I had to deal with. Right. And so I didn't, I didn't sort of bring that memory up. Mm -hmm. um, and then later, um, it was months later, when I was out of Walter Reed and I had been doing, uh, I'd, I'd been doing physical therapy and stuff for a couple, probably a couple months, mm -hmm. I think. When I sat down and thought, you know, I kind of, re I remember going somewhere. I wonder where I went, uh -huh. and that, and I just closed my eyes, and and I don't know how to describe this. Well, it's really met entering in a, into a meditation state, opening. You just open up, and it's like, whew, I, all these memories came back in such detail, and it was more again more real than anything in this life. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. Interesting. Um, okay, so we're jumping around a little bit, but so mm -hmm. you were in this healing environment. You blinked into the healing environment. A couple of beings were tuning you up. Um, is there anything more to say about that phase of it? No, that was the deep rest environment. Deep yeah. rest. It That's what like, I meant to say. Yeah. It really was like rejuvenation, and yeah. and yeah, yeah. And from there, and what was being rejuvenated? Like obviously not so much your body at that point, but some subtler. Essence yeah. of you, some soul I would quality. Say soul quality, or yeah. some kind of that organization of energy was being strengthened and relaxed, and mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, then, then you blinked into the healing phase, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I went back to the sort of the gathering, what I call the oh, gathering, okay. the stadium for, to kind of. An encore. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> to kind of nail down some some details about what I was going to do on kind of I say I describe it as kind of the architect level, mm -hmm. you know, the, the the project manager level, um, and then from there I I blinked to what I call the healing environment. Okay. Before we get to that, another question just occurred to me about the stadium scene. Um, mm -hmm. What more can you say about who all these beings were and what their function is? Um, do they have jobs, day jobs, and uh, did they just gather to do this download and then they scattered and went about their tasks? And what are, what are those tasks? Um, my, I felt like I knew m most of these beings, most of these thousands of beings, mm -hmm. um, and. It's when I go into it. I mean, I can, I can go back there and go into it and understand that everybody had sort of a different job. So, we might, you know, an equivalent would be, oh, there's the doctors over there, and there's the engineers over there, and there's the artists, the creative types over there. You know, it's like although that's um, just a metaphor. Yeah, absolutely, it's a metaphor. But there, there's something about. Um, those kinds of interests or mastery of certain ways of perceiving and ways of interacting with um, with all that exists mm -hmm. um, that somehow correlates to that in my mind. Mm. So these might be healers, whether you know we might call them doctors, but those beings, some of those beings, had an interest in, an ongoing interest in, or a mastery in healing. And when I say healing, not just, you know, we think of fixing the physical body or whatever. But in their case, it, it may be um, healing of large energy flows, or healing of organizations of energy that um, describe and maintain um, environments where we can um, go experience certain things or something like that. I was a little distracted by that internet connection problem, but um, mm -hmm. 
did, did you answer my question about what the function of these different beings is, the, their, their job description? Well, I think, um, I'm not sure that I could describe it in that way. If I, th I think that when I, when I think of them, I think of them not in a, a sort of job description or what is your task that you are doing. Yeah. I think of it more in a sense of what is your interests? Um, what are you exploring? If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, for instance, at one point in your book later on, you describe what you refer to as your personal security detail, not your human one, but your sort of like guardian angel type one. Uh, some beings that somehow influence and um, help to guide your life. So I was wondering if, you know, these beings in this gathering might have had functions like that, or, you know, you hear of the idea of devas that are responsible for um, certain aspects of, of creation and, and, and its manifestation into the relative or, and its governance in different ways and so on. So I was wondering if you just had anything of, of that nature in your understanding. Well, I think that they could be considered to be uh, for, for me acting in the role of colleagues. Um, in ex colleagues in exploration, mm -hmm. or um, and certainly you know uh, on some level they maintain because they my understanding is mo most of them were not also incarnated right. in bodies had never um, been or, and so, or weren't at the moment weren't at the moment right. I think there uh, my perception is that some of them had never been but most of them had been okay. and so being sort of in that um, broader perspective it and and me sort of coming down into a human mind perspective I'm sure that if I went to them and said hey I don't get something um, you know that that in in some way they would help me to understand or or I think they're available for that. Yeah. I'm not sure that I've, I've consciously used them in that way, but I think they would be available. Okay. Um, it's interesting yeah. that, um, I mean, there was a sort of an omniscience that you attained when you were in this state where you're not only able to transmit or download to them all simultaneously, but you're able to somehow grasp in your awareness who they all were and that you knew most of them, didn't know some of them. You know, there was this sort of like, Ordinarily, one couldn't tune into a multitude like that in such detail, but you were functioning, obviously, from a much deeper and broader perspective. Yeah, I, you know, we do a, a, a sort of a miniature version of that here in the physical world. We think we don't, but um, we're we're driving down the road and we're thinking about something else and whether we know it or not we notice the woman in the weird hat with the, the red feathers and um, you know we actually are noticing or paying attention to more things or monitoring more things than we realize mm -hmm. um, and and on the non-physical realm it just felt like that was exponentially expanded so yeah. that I could pay attention to or be aware of um, things on a on a much larger more what we would consider to be larger or more complex scale but it was effortless yeah. in the same way that you know it, if I get in a car I'm not thinking about every move I make anymore because I've been doing it for a long time I I am noticing though if something goes wrong you know um, even though I'm not consciously monitoring it I've heard interesting stories about sort of enlightened beings such as Neem Karoli Baba or Ama and others who, um, you know, are aware or in minute detail of something that happened that they couldn't possibly or shouldn't possibly have been aware of. For instance, I just read one the other day that Ram Dass posted about when he went into New Delhi or something to renew his passport. And uh, he, he was trying to be all pure and yogic and walking around in white robes, barefoot and cannot circus. And he ended up sort of 
indulging in some biscuits, and he considered that to be a, a bit of a guilty pleasure. And um, then he came back to Neem Karoli Baba's ashram, and the first thing Neem Karoli asked him was, did you enjoy the biscuits? You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so he was kind of, obviously, in his experience, I don't know whether he read his mind at that point, or he, was, he had a broader awareness, which was picking up on details that the ordinary person wouldn't cognize. Yeah, I think that you can, s it's not inconceivable to have that awareness when you're in the physical body. And yeah. I've experienced it, not for any length of time, like I'm yeah. sure that person has, but, um, but, and maybe all of us have had little, little snippets of that, but certainly, yeah. you know, sometimes just sitting here and, and just know something. Well, how yeah. do you know that? You, you, we. The only thing that keeps us from knowing that is the way we have taught ourselves or been taught to perceive. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we've been taught or we've taught ourselves um, that these things are real and these things are not. These perceptions are real. These are not. That um, in order to be sane, you have to perceive in this way. Yeah. And so we kind of. Um, build little walls and so we're going down this path but if we if we knock down the walls then it's possible to perceive all of this um, and it, it sounds overwhelming it sounds like well I, I, I'd be crazy then mm -hmm. but if you if you really were in that space you wouldn't be crazy because it's it's effortless there's no I don't know how to describe it. You know, we we feel or like, or we've been trained to block out a lot of background stuff. Yeah. So I'm not listening to the clock in the other room, and I'm not listening to the train that goes by outside. I I I hear it on some level, but I tune that out. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it feels like well, if I opened up to everything, then it would just it would be overwhelming. You'd yeah. just go crazy. But it's not like that. If you open up to everything, there is no pressure at all whatsoever. Yeah. I think it depends upon your capacity and your readiness and your the degree of integration and stability and so on. I mean, there are people who take a big LSD trip or something and they, they're opened up to all kinds of stuff that would that pretty much incapacitates them for f normal mm -hmm. functioning in everyday life. So you wouldn't want to be in that condition all the time. And I've also talked to people who like, you know, they have some big opening and then they can't go to the to Walmart or something because they're they're hearing right. everybody's thoughts and you know it's just right. too TMI as the saying goes, you know, too much information. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, if we don't have, you know, that those yogis, they they get there step by step right so they're readying themselves to understand and to comprehend and to um to handle that perception yeah if we take that leap and just go oh i've got that perception i'm going to open up to that i've got it well okay now you've got it now you're still going to have to go through those steps yeah that the yogi did and now it might be harder because now you're like <laughs> trying to also handle this perception yeah it was with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi one time and someone said, can't you just enlighten us, you know, get it over with. And yeah. he said, well, you know, maybe I could, but if I did just like that, it would take 10 strong men to hold you down. Right. <laughs> you know, there yeah. would just be too much too soon. Right. Yeah. Um, on this note, there's a couple interesting things I got from your book. Um, a couple, I'll read them. One, says, one is, being familiar with operating within a physical reality was acknowledged as requiring a high degree of specialized skill from the perspective of those personalities at the gathering. The gathering being this big amphitheater of people. Uh, and then here's another one. The razor focus required to remain in the collective physical is intensely satisfying for the whole self. I found both of those interesting. It's like, you can elaborate, but um, just the... Uh, that it's not necessarily easy. It's actually quite a, a, a skill to be able to function in the in the concrete, dense physical world as we do. And and those beings who weren't doing that were kind of impressed with your ability to do so. Yeah, um, they admired I think you. that surprised me. <laughs> I think um, 
because I often think of the physical life as kind of a slog. Yeah. So it was fun to perceive it in that way. And maybe it was that was that perception was given to me for a reason, you mm -hmm. know, because I happen to think it's often a slog. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it, um, the what I was shown, and you know, I, I can only how do you describe it? But it was like. Um, it was like a razor's edge of of concentration yeah. that had to be held very steadily. In the same way, you were talking about yogis and how, you know they learn how to how to balance their mind in in a very particular way and hold it steady. Mm -hmm. And it, and that's what I was being shown that on some level we know how to do that or we wouldn't be maintaining ourselves in this physical world. We would be we would have a much different perception of, <laughs> of our experience. Yeah. And we wouldn't. We would be in and out of our bodies, and we would be. Um, it, it, it would be very, um, very, very much uh, less um, coherent as an experience. Yeah, is what it like. I once heard it described as um, culturing the ability to maintain broad, comprehensive awareness and. Um, you know, narrow focus at the same time, not either mm -hmm. or, but both at the same time. And um, and again, this thing you said about the razor focus required to remain in the collective physical is intensely satisfying for the whole self. Um, late, lately, I've taken up a sport called pickleball, which is like a racket sport, yeah. and it requires extreme like attention and alertness and quickness and yeah. focus and stuff. And I just find that uh, after an hour or two of playing, I'm euphoric from the, yes. the the kind of juxtaposition of of the you know the silent awareness and the intense focus. Yes, yeah. I often think of sports when I think of how to describe that, um, because sports sports require when. When you're operating on a certain level, sports requires that or invites you into that um, intense focus. And yet you also, like you say, that that awareness br opens up enough that you, for instance, playing hockey, you're moving really, really quickly yeah. and you're using minute physical skills. Yeah. And yet you, if somebody asked, you, you should be able to tell where everyone else is on the ice, yeah. even though you can't see them. Yeah, you that, have to know that. That kind of awareness, um, you know, you can really, athletes know the zone, yeah. you know? They know that. Um, they don't need to call it um, uh, uh, an awakening or, you know, <laughs> they don't have to use the spiritual terms. They know it anyway. It doesn't matter what you call it. But their descriptions um, of it are very much akin to people's descriptions of awakening or an enlightened state you read some of these athletes like billy jean king or you know michael jordan or whatever when they're really in the zone you think wow it's yeah. not, it's, they could be like a the autobiography thing. of a yogi or something right yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yep. and it's funny when i make a mistake playing that game the immediate impression is there was a lapse of attention you know yes. i didn't maintain the focus yeah you right. know exactly what happened yeah yeah interesting yeah um okay so we're we're kind of cruising around here um so you, is there is there anything more to say about the the healing environment that you were in and when they were tuning you up and so on? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Now then you went into one where you were kind of like setting this setting up the scene for re-entry into the physical and you were playing with different possibilities. Oh, what if you lost your eye or what if you mm -hmm. didn't lose your eye? What if you lost your arm? You know, and and you actually you and the the sadists that were doing that with you found, <laughs> found that very funny. <laughs> we did. I still find it funny. <laughs> yeah, we were. I was in this environment where uh, we were. We had like a bird's eye view of the truck and the desert. What was going on down there? And um, it, it felt like we were maybe forty-five degree angle and up. I don't know, hundred feet or something. So we were looking down on the scene, and I was with two people. One of them who felt like an old, old friend, mm -hmm. friend, colleague, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the other one felt like um, maybe learning how to do this or watching us or something. Not quite as involved. But this friend and I were. We do the equivalent of of um, waving a hand. 
and and set setting certain injuries in my body mm -hmm. and then as soon as we did that we would see a flash of the home of my life with those injuries what that would look like yeah. so we would we would wave a hand and we would put shrapnel in my brain so that I you know I couldn't I couldn't talk and right. we watched the whole thing and we just fall down laughing we thought that was hilarious and huh. we would wave a hand and and um, my arm was severed, so I didn't have a right hand. So I had to learn to write and read, and, or write and um, feed myself and do everything with my left hand. And we thought that was just hilarious. Mm -hmm. And of course, none of this is funny from the physical world perspective. It isn't. <laughs> it's not funny. It's hard to do when we're in a physical body. But from that perspective, it was understood that that physical life is not real in the way that we experience it. Mm. That we all, at the end, we all get up and walk away. If we think of it as actors on a stage, we don't always write a nice little rom-com, you know? Sometimes we're gonna write a tragedy or a drama, and why do, why do we like to go to those things? Be for various reasons, you know? It, it, we learn something from it, we get to experience certain emotions in a way that doesn't threaten us, or um, we, we figure something out while we're watching that, or something within us gets validated. There's lots of reasons for doing that. Well, if, if we think kind of on, on a parallel level, that we, we create these lives for ourselves, um, we don't always make them all cute and pretty. We're going to give ourselves challenges. We're going to give ourselves some drama or some trauma or um, whatever in order to experience or explore that which we want to explore. But we all get up at the end of the, when the curtain goes down, we all stand up. No one has died. We all stand up and we're whole and we're perfect and we're complete and we take a bow. Mm -hmm. So that was the perspective that we were laughing from. Yeah, let's let's dwell on this a little bit more. Um, there's, there was a book called uh, "Why Bad Things Happen to Good People" or "Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People" or something like that. And um, obviously, a lot of people have a problem. People become atheists, for instance, when they are hit by the enormity of something like the Holocaust or you know, their child dying or, or something that just seems so horrific that they have a hard time believing in any kind of a <clears throat> benign or compassionate God or, or intelligence governing the universe. Uh, and yet I don't believe you have that attitude at all. And, um, and, and you know, I'm just trying to mel milk this out a little bit. I mean, you know, be, well, to take another example, this notion of people choosing their experiences. Um, you know, sometimes people guilt trip somebody who comes down with cancer or something. They say, well, you chose it. You must have mm -hmm. done something bad, you know, or, or you must have, you know, this is your karma, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And it seems rather callous and, and mm -hmm. insensitive when, when people speak that way. So there's several points in there you could address. Yeah, there is um, several points. So I should written down a couple notes because I'm going to forget something. I'm going to just, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to start yeah. where you ended. So, um, the, the fact that the, those people who say, um, you create, well, you created this experience. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a misunderstanding. Um, it may not have been you as a personality mind. Um, and, and so, um, and so putting that on someone kind of doesn't make sense. If it's your whole self or your soul or however, whatever word you want to use for it, if it's that, if it's that, um, that non-physical, um, broader awareness of you that has chosen this um, experience of cancer or getting blown up or whatever it is, it's going to be for a reason and a good reason. So there's something worthwhile. There's something valuable in that experience. Yeah, let me it's interject very quickly here. Um, so you use the play metaphor, like, you know, we all stand up at the end of the play and clap or whatever. Um, so that's just entertainment. But, but you're saying that there's something more educational about these experiences that we have, however horrific they may be. 
Well, educational, I, I, you know, we have all these ideas about education because you get tested and there's, um, you got to do it by this time. And I prefer the word exploration okay. because it's open-ended and there's no test. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're exploring something and we're exploring it together. Um, and if you want to go back to the play metaphor, um, everyone who's on that stage, every, every character is essential to the play, even the littlest, you know, when the, even the extras, if the extras aren't there, it's not going to work very well. Right. So um, it's all, it's all valuable to the play, to mm -hmm. the story that's being told. It's all necessary. And in the same way that it, you know, in ways that you may not understand, you're getting cancer may be serving humanity. It may be serving your family. It may be serving your neighbors. You don't know. And people are, people often ask me, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? And a better question is often, how do I best handle this? I may not know why this is happening to me and it may feel really bad to me. But if, I mean, I chose my injuries. When I came back into the physical world, I wasn't always happy about that, right. you know? <laughs> I wasn't always like, yeah, it's great that I can't see out of this eye, it's just fine. No, sometimes I was not happy at all about that. But you remembered but, having chosen them. Right, You're I remember like having kicking chosen yourself them. or why didn't I choose something? Well, I good. didn't I didn't always. I mean, I don't remember ever kicking myself for it. What I remember is thinking I wish I could remember all the reasons why, because uh, maybe it would help my physical mind, yeah. but I don't remember. So you knew you chose so them, I'm but you just didn't remember trust. why you chose them. Right. So right. I'm just going to trust that those reasons are good. And instead of asking myself or beating myself up with why, 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 why me, why me, yeah. or what did I do wrong, I'm going to say to myself, here I am. How do I best handle this yeah. for myself and for everyone around me? I, maybe I can be cheerful within this. Maybe there's maybe there's something about this that I experience um, in a whole new way because I'm willing to set aside my judgment of myself. Yeah, you know what's interesting about you, among other things, is that uh, when you consider that PTSD is such a problem these days, and, uh, and I know you actually experienced some of that. We can even talk about it if you like, and and that you know the number of um, ex-military people dying from suicide is much greater these days than the number actually dying in any kind of conflict. Um, so, you know, most of the people c have come back with depression and drug abuse and alcoholism and suicide, suicidal tendencies and so on. You came back with, from this experience with a whole new, in a way, brighter outlook on life, more optimistic, more, more cosmic, more, more insightful, more wise. You know, I mean, why do you feel that that was your reaction to this um, this traumatic event as contrasted with the norm? I think it all has to do with the out-of-body or near-death experience that Which I had. Which most people don't have, yeah. Right, or yeah. they don't remember. Or don't remember, right. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever uh, tried to work with... Um, service people who have you know, been traumatized by, by their experience? Yeah, I've, um, I've worked with a couple of individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I did, um, I'm not really sure what to say about this. It's a very kind of touchy subject with me because I think that, um, I think that a lot of, well, I, for one thing, I think that some of the, a lot of the PTSD may be as much physical as it is mental. So um, I think there's a lot more traumatic brain injury than is being diagnosed. Yeah. Um, and I think that every, every instance of PTSD is different because everybody is an individual and they have different recipe of disaster going on inside, you know? Um, and so 
there's no one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And my experience, you know, relating my experience to someone who has PTSD, um, maybe it will help a few, maybe it would help a few of them, or maybe it would change their perspective in some way that would help them. But just as many, it, they just wouldn't get it. It wouldn't mean anything to them. Yeah. And I didn't get any, you know, I didn't get any magic wand or magic insight into um, into helping these people. I wish I did. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what that's, else to say about that's that. That's a good answer. I mean, some of them might actually be envious or resentful of you, you know, for having such an interesting experience where they didn't or something. Yeah, I actually pro. I wonder, there's a, I can't remember this person's name. There's somebody doing studies on, um, on combat soldiers mm -hmm. who have had near-death experiences. Oh. And I actually think that they're probably a lot higher than anybody hears about. Yeah. Because that's not something that a soldier is, is going to be telling everybody. It's true. It's like airline pilots talking about UFO encounters or something. Right. <laughs> they want to exactly. lose their license. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's get back to the question, I, that multi-part question I asked earlier where you wanted to make sure you got all the bits. Um, mm -hmm. Just to sort of wrap that one up because you already gave a pretty good answer. So you would say across the board, no matter how horrific the event that has taken place, the Holocaust, um, you know, Hiroshima, or anything, you know, Darfur, uh, that there's, from a bigger, broader, more cosmic perspective, all is well and wisely put, and there's some reason for these things happening that's not like the universe is a cruel and capricious and arbitrary place. Yeah, I would say that, um, first I would say that if it happens, we've all the, we've all agreed to it on some level, okay. um, and that doesn't mean that it can't have been otherwise, or that we can't choose differently now. Um, and and it doesn't mean that that was necessarily the best way to go about that exploration. You know, best foot forward, um, but it's again, it's. It's what we've got. Yeah. And so how do we best handle this? Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So I'm going to just like hit you with it. And people listening, uh, it, you know, as you're listening to the live interview, if you have any questions, just go to the upcoming interviews page on batgap.com and post your question because this is really the time to ask them unless you want to ask Natalie later on. Um, so these days, when you do uh, a psychic reading with people, um, what do you do? What do you perceive? What do they get out of it? I mean, and and is your ability to do such a thing has your ability to do such a thing been vastly enhanced by this whole thing you went through? I would say that it's not necessarily vastly enhanced, but my confidence in myself is enhanced. Mm -hmm. um, and when I do readings for people, I think that, um, I, I think probably asking one of my clients would be a better, <laughs> they would give you a better answer. I think that um, I don't get a lot of the, um, what's you know what's going to happen next week or okay. um you know that kind of question i'm not that kind of psychic i think um and i'm i'm also i get a lot of information for people about what to do about things or how to apply something so instead of just saying well you need to um you need to quit being a victim you know, quit thinking of yourself as a victim. Well, how do you do that? Yeah. You know, um, so I'm often given for people, I'm given um, maybe like um, affirmations or mantras or or ways to think about it differently or um, or exercises to do or, you know, in some way application seems to come through. Something practical. Something practical, yeah. Yeah. 
And who or what gives you that stuff? I don't always know that. Um, I mean, I, I, the way I receive information is, um, is every way. Sometimes I hear it, sometimes yeah. I see it, sometimes I feel it. And um, sometimes it's clear to me, someone sort of a, a being appears to me and, and I have a, a few people, or friends, colleagues, guides, whatever you want to call them, that, um, that I work with, that sometimes I feel they're right there giving me information. Other times I just feel like I do, I do, it doesn't necessarily matter to me. Sometimes I feel like, oh, that definitely came from your guide or your buddy, you yeah. know. Um, but I can't say that it always comes from the same place. Okay. Yeah, just the other night after having finished reading your book, I was watching David Letterman interview Barack Obama. And Obama was saying that, you know, with reference to himself and David, he was, he was saying, you know, many people have had the same kind of upbringing and education and are, are at least as smart as we are and everything else. But we're kind of lucky, you know, we've had these lucky breaks mm -hmm. that has made us so successful. And I was thinking of your reference to the personal security detail of guardian, or which we might think of as guardian angels and how it almost seems like you were, in your book, you describe how they help to orchestrate, orchestrate circumstances such that things can possibly work out much better than they otherwise might have. And um, I was thinking, well, somebody like Obama, whatever, you know, who seemed to have that kind of destiny, you know, perhaps he was being guided in ways he wasn't aware of uh, to make things work out as they did. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I think um, someone like him who has a very visible public um, role and and a and apparently um, large influence on culture. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that that person has a lot of help. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean they have more help than you have. Mm -hmm. You know, it, in. I feel like I have a lot of help. Yeah. I mean, I think we all do. Me. And I think yeah, that Irene. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Irene. Yeah. Um, and Jerry think, and Larry and Ralph. Yeah, and right. <laughs> Dan. I think that you know we tend to believe that people who have more influence in the physical world mm -hmm. are more important than we are. So Barack Obama is more important than the guy who pumped my gas yesterday, mm -hmm. and. Um, and uh, Maya Angelou is more important than the maid who cleaned my hotel room three weeks ago in San Diego. Mm -hmm. But you don't know that. Right. You don't know that. We all have equal influence on this reality, whether we know it or not. Just our presence being here changes the structure of this reality and the relationship between everything within it, every consciousness within it. Mm -hmm. So um, does Barack Obama have more influence in the physical world that we walk around in each day and, you know, um, turn on the news and there's Barack Obama and, you know, whatever. Does he influence, do, appear to influence more people? Yes. Is he more valuable to, to this w reality than you are? No. Mm. Yeah. There's no hierarchy. Well, where, how far do you take that? I mean, is, um, is the most influential cow or mosquito of the same significance as the least influential human? I mean, is, is, is there any sort of demarcation or, or hierarchical quality in any, among any of the, of the species? Well, or members of any one species? In this perspective, in this perspective I'm talking about, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the same kind of thing that, uh, well, perspective is everything. You know, when I'm in the healing environment and I'm waving a hand and putting shrapnel in my head mm -hmm. so I can't talk and I'm having a hard time um, living in this physical world, 
that's only funny from that perspective. It's not yeah. funny when I'm in this physical world. It looks different. And in the same way that um, is every consciousness that's having an experience here in this physical world, is it equally valuable? Yes. Um, from, from our human um, perspective, is that true? No, there's things that are more important to a cat than things than they are to us and things that are more important to us than they are to a cow. And, you know, we're still having this experience. We're still having this human experience. Yeah. And so there's perspectives there um, that that we we perceive and we own. Um, but it doesn't mean that's all there is. You know, it, Western culture teaches it's either this or that. Right. But it can be this and that. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, here's here's a this and that statement you made in your book. You said, "It is all real. It is all illusion." You know, mm -hmm. and it's not either or. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's both. Yeah. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, Shankara said something like that. He said, "The world is an illusion. Brahman alone is real. The world is Brahman." Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Speaking of funny, um, here's a question that came in from um, someone named Josanna in Canada. She said, um, what is the funniest thing that happened or was said to you on the other side? I think the funniest thing that happened was when we put the shrapnel in my head. Yeah, yeah that's a riot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why I refer to them as sadists. You know? It's like who would get their jollies out of something like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so on that note, um, so you actually say, I think what you're actually saying in the book is that you could have come out of this with any number of different types of injuries or, or degrees of severity of injuries. But you and, and, and these characters you were collaborating with <laughs> kind of like monkeyed around for a while and, and came up with a combination that you thought looked good enough and you went with it. Yeah, I would say that um, what we came up with was a combination that would serve me the best mm -hmm. for what I intended to do. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we, when we set an injury, like I said, we could see an instantaneous, we had an in instantaneous knowing of what the rest of that life looked like. Yeah. And it's really hard to explain that because <laughs> I could see it all and I can still see it all. And I don't know how to explain it because it all happens in an instant. But, um, but then, you know, so in a sense, while we were having a hilarious time, we were also figuring things out. Mm -hmm. You know, is this going to work? No, that's not going to work. That's <laughs> to work try something else okay let's try this no that's not going to work you know and in a way we were exaggerating things um and and you know for the fun of it but then in the end um okay quit fooling around and you know choose the ones okay choose that it's not as severe that'll work better this will work better pick that pick that good we're good yeah and so the injuries uh were let's see you you had a hole in your head and um and you, all the bones on the right side of your face were broken. Your retina was detached, and you lost sight in, in that eye. Uh, your radius and ulna were were broken in, entirely. Your your heel was, uh, or your foot was injured pretty badly. Um, am I forgetting anything? No, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so that happened about 11 years ago or so. Um, and you said that you chose the injuries which would serve you best. So how has, how has this particular collection of injuries and disabilities served you? Or is it not rational and you can't really put it in words? Yeah, it's not rational and I can't really put it in words. Um, and I think that it's, it's also, um, some of it is ongoing in a way that um, like, it, well, it's layered too. I mean, on some, it, it's, some of it is obvious to a human mind. For instance, when I couldn't see out of one eye, um, 
my the whole idea of seeing changed it became new for me again mm -hmm. and in that way my perception um, changed what I paid attention to changed and you mean so, that you treasured it or you valued it more? Is that what you mean? Like it was, pre it was precious to you because you'd lost half of it or something? Well, different? that's part of it. But also, um, you know, we like I, I said, when when you get in a car, you don't you don't necessarily think about every move that you're making right. it now because you've done it for a long time. Well, when I lost sight in one eye, suddenly I had to pay attention to everything mm -hmm. again. Or you'd fall downstairs, which you actually or did. Or I'd fall down the stairs, which I did. Mm -hmm. Or I would, um, I was terrified when I started driving. I was terrified that someone would step out into, in front of my car on the right side right. of the car and I wouldn't see them. Mm -hmm. And it actually happened. Wow. And it was, it was absolutely terrifying. Um, and so you become aware of the world and you have your relationship to what's going on around you in a different way. Yeah. And so when everything becomes new again, you, you know, the world as if new again. Mm -hmm. And it's in a way, you know, in some ways that's a gift to become aware of things that you have, have just allowed to become habit you know next time you brush your teeth pay attention to how you're holding the toothbrush mm -hmm. and how you're moving it I can't do that anymore it's hard for me to do it because my wrist doesn't work very well yeah. and my there's dead there's dead areas in my hands so holding things is weird so I get to know the world and my relationship to the world in a new way mm -hmm. in, in some instances yeah, interesting mm -hmm. um, Here's a question that just came in from Andres Jimenez from Bogota, Colombia. Um, he asks, do you think there was a connection between the geography of where you were, where you were on the planet, Iraq, and the beings that showed up during your experience after the explosion? If this is the case, what does it mean for humanity? No, there was no relation between the geography and who I interacted with in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, though my understanding is no matter where I would have been blown up, <laughs> um, I, would have, I would have encountered the same beings because they're not dependent upon the physical geography. world. No, yeah. Yeah, didn't have anything to do with that. Right. I would say that um, the geography in a way had significance to what I was doing or what the influence of my experience ended up being. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that would be, I mean, I don't think I could explain that because it's sort of, it doesn't kind of make sense to in the physical world. I can see it. I can, I have the concept, but I don't, I wouldn't even know where to begin kind of. Um, I don't, I don't know how to translate that. Okay. Good enough. Um, here's a question from William Dickinson in Marshfield, Wisconsin. First, he said, Oh, you know William? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, first, he says, I look forward to your daily posts of wisdom. So do you have some kind of mailing list of daily little posts that people can um, subscribe to? Or is he just talking about Facebook or something? Yeah, Facebook. Okay. Thanks, William. Yeah, I'll, Facebook. I, I try to every day post right. something on Facebook. I'll link to your Facebook page when I put up the BatGap page so that people can go there. Um, and then he asks, I am wondering if you still have a connection with the world you experienced during your NDE. Do you feel you have a closer connection with your guides? Yes, I do still have connection with those beings. I do still go, I, I say go see them, um, <laughs> when really it's just a matter of shifting focus. Yeah. Um, and a, a closer relationship with my guides. I think, um, yeah, I think I do. I think that um, that maybe, you know, before this experience, I believed in them and I had had a couple of very intense experiences, but this remind, in a way it reminded me that I am a, a friend and colleague of them, not, they're not wiser and 
bigger and somehow um, better than I am. I, I have a different relationship with them now. I feel like um, that they're... I feel like consciously I know them better. I, I don't think, you know, un, uh, as, a, as a whole being, of course, I knew them. Mm -hmm. But consciously, maybe I, I have more familiarity with them. And so I, I both trust them more and argue more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting. Um, now, I read so many books and talk to so many people that I forget where I got this, but I think I might have gotten it from you. Um, and if not, we can move on. But I think you were talking about how um, different um, structures of collective consciousness have their own autonomy and identity, um, such, such as, you know, I mean, the individual consciousness is one thing, family consciousness. It's like, it's like a being in, in and of itself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, national consciousness, world consciousness. Um, was that you saying that? And do you have any comments on that thought? Yeah, it could have been me. I don't really remember, but mm -hmm. it sounds kind of like something I might say. Mm -hmm. um, and so one way that that I describe it that may be easier to, ex to perceive is um, if you think about birds in a flock, mm -hmm. the, the, the individual birds are still individuals. Right. But when they fly in those flocks and they make those sort of patterns in the sky yeah. that flock is also its own it has its own identity it has its own reality and it has its own personality um, and, and when you think about different families you know when families get together they kind of have their own language and their own personality and they have their own um, their own flow and it becomes that becomes I'm not going to say an um, uh, an a, a, a thing, you know, but it, it becomes an identity or it becomes, it, it becomes energetically a signature mm -hmm. and it has influence and it has, it has some kind of form yeah. in a sense. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, you've traveled to different countries and so have I and, and you go to a different country and there's a whole feeling in mm -hmm. the, the minute you step off the plane sometimes that, you, mm -hmm. you, it, that is distinctly different from the place you've been. And it's not just, um, you know, the people look different or something. It's something in the very essence of the place, the atmosphere mm -hmm. of the place that just has a totally different flavor to it, you know? Right. Like a different yeah. consciousness to that place. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different, um, yeah, it's a, it's a different um, chord, C-H-O-R-D, you yeah. know? It, if you take all those little pieces of um, people who emphasize different different aspects of perception than we do, or um, understand things and talk about things in a different way, and so they relate to things in a different way, they relate to their arm in a different way, or their chair, or that cow, and all of those things put together end up creating this um, this. Uh, identity yeah. this sort of cloud or something yeah. yeah and the reason I think this is significant to this whole discussion to this, sh this show is that um, you know if the whole is is a is more than some of its parts but is made of its parts then modification of its parts can change the whole absolutely uh, you know like you could say a forest is made up of trees if uh, if most of the trees are you know, drought stricken in the whole forest, then the forest is going to look gray and withered. But if, if more of the trees individually become nourished, then the, the forest begins to look better. So, you know, we as individuals in a society can enhance the collective consciousness through our individual evolution. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in a very sort of visible way, mm -hmm. um, since Martin Luther King Jr. Day is coming up, yeah, <laughs> you know, think of Rosa Parks. You know, sure, it's one that. person to spark something off, mm -hmm. one individual. And, you know, people often say to me, I feel so powerless. I feel so hopeless with this administration. I feel so, um, you know, I look at the world and I see such a mess. I feel, and I, it, it, we're not powerless. If you, when you feel, when you look at something that feels so much bigger than you, 
and feel like you can't do anything about it. If you put that thing in a ball of light, or if you just set it in, create a river of love in front of you and set it in that, mm -hmm. you have done something. You yeah. have you've already healed that thing. Mm -hmm. We we as individuals, I really, you know, before I had this experience, I, w I was, I just thought one person does not make a difference in anything. And now I know one person makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. And not even necessarily by doing something overt like Rosa right. Parks did, but right. just by being what you are uh, right. and being more fully what you are, mm -hmm. you, you know, you radiate an influence. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like you often refer to the whole self, uh, capital W, capital S. If you mm -hmm. can, you know, realize the whole self more fully, embody it more fully, mm -hmm. then you're going to infuse more of the quality of that into, into the environment, into other people, everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, a few more notes here that jumped out at me as I was reading your book. Um, we've touched on this a little bit, but maybe we can circle back to it. Um, you, you spoke about good and evil and how actions that appear wrong within the physical realm may be perfectly right from a broader perspective. For instance, you and the man who built the bomb that blew you up may have had some sort of agreement. And again, this sounds a little harsh. It may sound, you know, like you agreed, somebody agreed to get raped or agreed to get murdered or, you know, agreed to have, that some child agreed to get hit by a car or whatever. Um, but again, if we really want to understand how the universe works, we need to contemplate this possibility, at least be open to the open minded enough to, to think about it and see whether it might hold any merit. Well, I, I write about that in the book, the mm -hmm. good and evil thing. And I, I tried to do that very carefully. Yeah, it's because touching. I think that it's very easy to be misunderstood. Right. And so I don't know that I really want to say very much about it here because okay. it well, what did you say in the book <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hold you to that <laughs> uh, um, uh, what again like you said what what looks bad to us mm -hmm. may it may it's it can't happen without our agreement first of all mm. on some level we agreed to that experience and, um, and you know, I can hear people going, I did not agree to this experience. Yeah. <laughs> I did not do this. Um, but if we could really see the big self, picture. The whole self may choose something that you don't want to experience as a human mind. Yeah. Um, you know, um, the three-year-old wants 10 cookies. I have to have 10 cookies or I'm going to die. <laughs> I have to. I have to have those cookies. They're the only thing that will make me happy. And the adult is just looking like, no way. It's not going to help you. Yeah. And then you're not going to get the 10 cookies. Mm -hmm. Or the little kid falls down and scratches a knee and comes running to her mom. And her mom is like, you know, not a big injury. Right. Kiss it, make it all better, go away. Well, on some level, um, when, you, when you get on a on a non-physical, whole self level, looking at these pains that we have and these what can be truly in the physical can be truly horrific but when you when you can un, unattach yourself from that experience and look at it from a whole self perspective you may see the incredible deep value that you are getting from it and everyone around you is getting from it yeah and i don't think that understanding this would necessarily lead to passivity or you know blind acceptance of wrong things i mean you know no, absolutely it's, it's like it, it was good that i think from my perspective that we went and opposed hitler and right. um you know it's good that we try to stop the opioid epidemic or or various right. way or the whole we too movement now you know people standing up and refusing to accept sexual harassment anymore we so there's nothing implied in what you're saying here that we should just sort of we okay we agreed to this you know we're just going to go along do whatever you want to me it's that's not what you're saying absolutely not what i'm saying yeah. no we're all playing our roles and we all know in our hearts what's right or wrong so yeah if um you know 
if, if we are confronted with um, uh, cancer, we don't go, well, I chose this. Yeah. So we'll I won't get go to the a best doctor. Treatment we can. I, I'll just, yeah, we play it out. Yeah. You know, or if somebody is, um, if we have a Hitler who is, um, you know, doing all his Hitler stuff, it doesn't mean we go, yeah, well, you know, we created that, so we better put up with it. No, you know, maybe you created that in order to stand up for it, up to it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you, you still play it out. You yeah. don't just, that doesn't mean that you're passive to what you consider bad or evil. You know, in the physical world, in our humanity, in our connection with each other, and our interactions with each other, we, we have the chance to, uh, to step forward in our best selves. Mm -hmm. And that means, um, it may mean that, you know, even though we created this, um, we can now see something better. And so we, we step in and, and act because yeah. every act creates the next experience. One example that comes to my mind of why the perspective you are offering here uh, could really be helpful to a person, and I, I, I could probably come up with a lot of examples, is uh, a fellow I've been corresponding with in the UK who has a drinking problem. And he says he just gets so pissed off at everything, the government and stupid people and, and the boss and, and other stuff like that, that he has to like, you know, down a, four or five cans of beer every night to just mellow out because he's just so angry at everything. And I, I think that if we could have more of a, a Byron Katie-ish loving what is acceptance of that there's some kind of broader picture be, behind things that happen and be more accepting. Who, who is it that, what's that saying of the Alcoholics Pledge actually about, you know, knowing the wisdom to know the difference between the things that you have mm -hmm. some control over and don't and you know, mm -hmm. doing what you can about the things you do have control over and accepting the things that you, you don't. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, I, 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 statements like the, thing, the kind of things we're discussing right now, I think helps to culture the, uh, a broader, deeper perspective, which makes you less inclined to fight against uh, things in a futile way. Yeah, I think um, a few things. I think that... Uh we believe that anger and outrage are necessary in order to act. Yeah. But what's really true is that when you can find that place of balance and peace and then choose it with your discernment to act, that you'll actually be more effective. I mean, this is talking on a very practical level. Again, Martin Luther King Jr., was he outraged and angry? Yes. Is that where he was speaking from? No. Right. Same with Gandhi. It's like Gandhi, exactly. Yeah, not, who was Martin MLK's inspi inspiration in many ways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And those guys had huge impact. Yes, they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Rosaline in Ireland. Um, she asks, do some beings decide not to incarnate as human, and, if so, do they evolve in ways that do not involve as much suffering as being human? Are there other ways to spiritually evolve that involve less suffering than being human? I think there are infinite ways to evolve, because infinity is infinite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think that um, I quote, I, I have a quote in my book, and it's often attributed Buddhist to Buddhists. I don't know if it really is, but um, the, the quote is, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Oh, yeah, I wrote that one down, actually. Yeah. Um, pain, pain, we all experience pain. I mean, that's part of how this physical world is set up. It's mm -hmm. part of the, it's part of the potential that is um, that's set in the energetic signature of this reality. Yeah, um, it also but, is extremely helpful if you put your hand on a stove, you, you want to yes, feel pain, yeah. Absolutely. Um, but suffering is entirely um, 
it's entirely a mental um, experience. And so when it's said that suffering is optional, what's being said is that if you're suffering, then it's because of the, w the way that you're thinking about this. Right. It's not that someone is, has a suffer knife and the suffer knife is in your heart. It, it's a belief system. Yeah. You, I'm sure you know this because you know more about Buddhism than I do. <laughs> Not a, that's but, just called um, Buddha at the gas pump, but I've never really studied Buddhism. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the, um, the Buddhists talk about non-attachment. Yes. Um, as soon as as soon as we are have pain, then what we are taught to do is to judge that pain in some way. This is bad. This is bad um, because it's uncomfortable or because it, whatever. Um, it's bad um, also, you know, we, then we, now new age has added a layer to that. It's bad because now I cause that to myself in right. some way and I don't understand how it's my fault. Um, you know, so we add all these judgments and it's the judgments that cause the suffering. So I had, um, when I, after I came back to consciousness, um, I was I was sitting in the truck. I did a few things around the truck, um, and then I sat back in my seat waiting for the rest of the team to come and help us. And I was sitting there. And I had my hand over my eye. This arm was shattered, and I couldn't see out of my eye. So I just I didn't know what was wrong with it. I so I just covered it. And I was looking around, and I thought, what if I can't ever see out of this eye again? And I had this flash of excitement. I got so excited. Huh. I thought, if I can't see out of this eye, maybe I'll be able to see other worlds more clearly. Hmm. And what if and both I, eyes had been blinded? I don't know. Yeah, you don't I know. mean, when I think about that as a human being, it's terrifying to right. me. But, but in that moment, it was a moment devoid of fear. Mm -hmm. And when you erase fear, you erase suffering. Yeah, some people say um, Christ never suffered, and they're not saying he didn't get crucified and, and that his body didn't experience pain, but they, they were, they're saying that his state was such that he you know, was established in a, in a field beyond fear, beyond suffering, and you know, that, you know, well, anyway, it's just a kind of extreme example of the point you've been making. Yeah, inshallah, I mean, I hope he didn't suffer. That would be a horrible way to go. Yeah. Um, but I think that um, again, you know, I think that yogis um, practice that this, you know, on a, a daily level. They understand, um, and and meditation can help to sort of um, bring you into or give you an experience of that perspective. Yeah. In your book, you say um, that the most practical outcome from your NDE is how you deal with emotions. And uh, Mark Peters from Santa Clara has just sent in a question saying, can you speak out how your NDE impacted your fear, if any, of death and life? I felt his question was perhaps relevant to you saying that how you deal with emotions is the most practical outcome of, of your experience. Yeah, I think um, I didn't have any fear of death before that. Um, I never have had any fear of death, and I've never sort of understood it. Mm -hmm. I never kind of understood that fear because, to me, um, I always remembered that where I came from. I'm going to say so. I, to me, um, not having a body was like, <laughs> why would you be afraid of that? That's like great, <laughs> so easy, it's so great. Um, but I, I think I have had. A fear of life mm -hmm. and I think that I still do have some fear of life mm -hmm. I still there's still things that I'm you know it, it's possible to know these things and not to fully have fully digested them or to sort of to have fully put them into practice yeah they're a little bit conceptual still not necessarily visceral yeah I mean yeah. I think some of them are are visceral and, and others are like you know, I know it. 
I experienced it on some level, but um, but it's not it's not a habit. You know, I move in and out of it in the yeah. same way. So I'll give an example. Another example. I was lying in bed at Walter Reed, and um, I was in a lot of pain, and I was thinking about um, my eye again, and thinking, well. I don't want to be blind in that eye. I want to be able to see because I'm an artist and I want to be able to perceive the way I did perceive. And I was getting pretty upset about it. And all of a sudden this thought just entered my mind. It, I, it was like my own voice saying, well, it doesn't really matter. It's only 40 more years. Yeah. And, and I, I felt that, I experienced it, I knew it. I was like, yeah, it doesn't matter. 40 years is, it's nothing. Yeah, it seems a lot from the human perspective, but actually in yeah. terms of the big picture, right? Um, not that much. Right. So, but so I would you say- But I can't always that, hold that. Right. I can't always hold that perspective, you know? Um, so uh, do I experience fear? Yes. Am I more easily able to move myself out of that fear? Um, usually, mm -hmm. yeah, and I I am able usually to um, to trust also to trust my fear when I have it yeah. to just say well I d I don't know what to do about this right now mm -hmm. so I'll just experience it. With regard to the forty more years point, would you say that what you have been through has instilled in you a much greater sense of patience and tolerance and kind of a long-term vision where you know you just see things from a bigger picture kind of temporally as well as you know dimensionally um i'm not sure because i think i always had that tendency mm. and then working as an archaeologist kind of supported that tendency <laughs> Because yeah. you look at <laughs> long, stuff. yeah, long time frames mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> uh, and view change maybe in a little bit different way. I think that uh, I, th I think that it again. I I just have to say that I move in and out of you know um, the longer I'm here in the physical world. Um, the more the more effort I have to put toward maintenance of that <laughs> that broader perspective because it's easy to get wrapped up in the physical world huh. for everybody for all of us you know so meditation is important to me yeah sure. um, and, and sort of sometimes sitting and just pondering things and reminding myself of of um, what I really know is sometimes necessary, just like maybe it is for a lot of people. Yeah, I used to love to go to museums when I was a kid, you know, like the Natural History Museum or the Smithsonian and just kind of get this feeling of the, the time span. Even, even though I was a little kid, I got that kind of feeling of the ancientness of the world and of life and so on. And even now I love to look at galaxies. Whenever the going mm -hmm. gets rough, I, I sit, I'll just sit and look at a galaxy for a while and, and imagine all the trillions of life forms, you know, throughout the mm -hmm. how long it takes that galaxy to rotate even once, you know, and how much happens mm -hmm. to all these little dramas during that time period. It can kind of puts things in a different perspective. Yeah, I think a lot of people mm -hmm. don't like feeling that small. Oh, I love it. And, and I love it. Because you're not small. You are actually... You, you are also, actually are the galaxy. Yeah, you are that and beyond that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's just like the, your little individual expression is small, but right. that's but you you keep keep using the word whole self. Right. That's that's what you really are. Exactly. Yeah, you were just kind of like this little villi on on the mm -hmm. <laughs> a much. <laughs> <of life. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, something that comes up in these interviews from time to time, and that you touch upon in your book, is the notion of free will. And also, um, whether there is actually any person that we ultimately are. And some people argue in the negative on both of those. Um, I haven't interviewed Sam Harris, but he often goes into eloquent discussions of how 
there is no person and there is no free will. Um, and yet, you know, you talk about free will to choose among infinite possibilities. And you also talk about, you know, there's some kind of Natalie thing that, you know, even when the body died, went on, and, or nearly died, went on and had these experiences and made, you know, decisions here and there and came back. And, and I've, I've heard you allude to, you know, multiple lifetimes and so on. So um, I won't necessarily hit you with all the arguments why there's, why these people say there's no free will and no person. And I don't even know if I could, but what do you have to say on that whole line of thinking? Well, I think, again, it's dependent upon perspective. Mm -hmm. um, from our, from within our experience, my understanding and my experience says that we are co-creating with our whole selves. If we want to, if we want to kind of, oh, that's my whole self and this is me or that whole self is, I'm within that whole self. Um, <clears throat> We, we're co-creating, we're making choices, and we're, we're able to create as we go. So from that perspective, that's what something look, might look like. Um, but then if I go, I don't know how to put this, if I go out far enough, if I go in far enough, it's like um, that self, um, while becoming the one may sound like the individual is lost or there is no individual. Um, another way to perceive that is that ultimately I am everything. So is there an individual yes and no? Again, is it yes or is it no? It's yes and no. <laughs> um, is there, for, and, and again, from that perspective is, um, as the one is everything known or is everything already sort of already known and not known yes <laughs> i don't know how to you know i like these some of these concepts are i don't know how to unpack them i don't know how to describe yeah. them i think that was a good answer and it's kind of one I might give if I were talking to somebody who said that, which is that, yeah, in a way you're right, but that's, but it's not, it's multidimensional and, and right. there are levels in which you're not right. And, and it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be either or it's both and. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Nice. Alrighty. Well, um, I think I've covered all the notes that I, oh, here's an interesting thing. Um, you requested to the gathering, this collection of people whom you addressed or downloaded to, that you, you said, all right, I'll go back, but um, I want to stay awake to the enduring self upon returning to the physical. So how has that worked out? Did they keep their promise? <laughs> well, I don't know that they promised anything or it was just an agreement, Yeah. but um, I feel like you know, come, being back in the physical, I feel like, well, I could never really lose that awareness. I mean, I've had that awareness really since I was a child. Right. So um, really all it was was an affirmation, really, you know, that um, that this awareness will remain. And maybe on in a way I was asking for, um, you know, to be that, that, yogi <laughs> or that uh, in the sense of being that enlightened being um, where I'm always aware mm -hmm. and um, always aware of everything but you know here being now back in this physical world I like the physical world I like it I I don't like everything about it but but um, I, I like the familiarity of some of our screwed up perceptions it's okay I, I agreed to come back to this world as it is at this time for reasons. And so I don't think I really want that kind of awareness all the time in this world, to be honest. <laughs> I don't want to be the, you know, I think I would have to live a very different kind of life. And I, I like my life. I enjoy it. So that yeah. makes sense. It does. Um, 
So here's something you said that we could perhaps put in as an end note uh, to this conversation, which is that you said, my joy can only be destroy destroyed by believing that things can affect my joy. Yeah, that's again going back to, I think, um, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Yeah. Um, we think that joy or sadness, we're taught that those things are dependent on things outside of ourselves. We echolocate. You know, um, what does this person think of me? Um, we throw something out and then we wait for something to come back and then we go, oh, I'm sad or oh, I'm happy now. Um, but if you quit echolocating and just go inside yourself and choose, I'm just going to be joyful today. No matter what happens, I'm just going to be happy. Then you can do that. You can cultivate that and you can do that. Great. Yeah. Good advice. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I'll be putting up a page on batgap.com, which has you know a link to your website and all. And uh, you mentioned that you do some kind of psychic readings. So um, is that the main? Well, I, I would highly recommend your book to people. Um, Thank you. Application of Impossible Things. Why do you call it that? Why, how'd you come up with that title? Well, um, it just came to me. I didn't really come up with it, but um, I think that um, a lot of people come back from NDEs and say, oh, it's just beautiful. I can't describe it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, <laughs> then what good is that? I wanted to try to actually describe some of the things. Um, I didn't feel like they were necessarily impossible. And I think too that um, we make that distinction be, again between spiritual and physical mm -hmm. as if they are two different things and that the spiritual, um, some of those non-physical things simply can't be brought down into the physical world and be applied. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's true. I think it's all applicable. I think that we can um, live, well, you know, the, the physical is just a subset of, of the non-physical. It's all, it's all spiritual. It's mm -hmm. all physical. So it only makes sense that um, we, can, we can apply these things. Yeah. Well, I think you did a good job describing it. Um, I mean, I got a sense of it. Um, you're a good writer, um, Thank you. and uh, you know certain things just don't lend themselves well to description. Like try to describe the color red, for instance. It's like, right. what do you say? But um, you know, considering how otherworldly, in a sense, the dimensions you experienced are, I think you pretty did a pretty decent job. Thank you. Describing <laughs> to those of us in this world. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So I'll, I'll link to that book. I guess the Amazon page for that book. I'll link to your website, and um, people can get in touch if they want to find out what you're doing. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. So, so um, let me make some general concluding remarks just briefly. Mm -hmm. um, this is part of an ongoing series, as most of you are probably aware. If you would like to uh, stay in touch, go to batgap.com and. If you want to be notified of future interviews, you can just um, sign up for the little email that comes out every time I post one. If you, or you could subscribe on YouTube and to the channel, and then YouTube, I guess, will notify you when new ones are posted, or you can do both. Um, and uh, this also exists as an audio podcast for those who like to listen in that way. There's a page on BatGap for signing up on different devices and different services. Um, and a bunch of other stuff. If you just explore the menus, you, you might find something useful. Um, so thanks for listening or watching. And, and, you, and thank you, Natalie. I really appreciate it. Um, be well. I'm glad you decided to come back. And <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Rick. Thanks for having, inviting me on the show. I yeah. enjoyed it. Stick around for a while, and I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All righty. Bye. Bye-bye.